Hi, my name is Dennis. Welcome, welcome to Foundations Networking Enterprise Firewalls. Let's go ahead and get started about what we'll be learning today. So today we're going to do understanding architecture of enterprise class firewalls, and we'll talk about what enterprise really means in terms of how you select firewalls, including sizes. We want to be familiar with different firewall types and their scopes, so how many legs, where do you put different hosts and assets, and how you are going to protect them using firewall security policies. We also want to identify performance-based considerations for the firewalls. So how do you size them? What kind of other scope mechanisms? Uh, what kind of other stuff besides layer four to layer seven capabilities are? And how do you want to implement those firewalls across the network? So first and foremost, enterprise firewalls are exactly what it sounds like. It's made for the enterprise. And you're really all about saying, hey, I have more than a home network. I might have other security context needs. So in this case, we see what we have right here is a typical multi-tiered, multi-leg firewall. We have a DMZ zone right here. And that stands for demilitarized zone. So you might have web servers and email servers that are less trusted that could be more easily compromised. And you want to have your inner firewall or your inner zone uh, for specifically very corporate only uh, servers or networks. So you might have uh, inside, and then you have the outside segments here, which are untrusted, trusted, and somewhat trusted, hence the DMZ. The whole idea is that you have logical separation between different network types at either layer three or layer two, depending on how you deploy everything. You can deploy a firewall at layer two, just like a network switch or a bridge that only acts as a traffic cop rather than a router or, or anything like that. Again, you're all about logical separation about what hat sets are here. So you can have a, at layer three, you would have them at 10.10 uh, 10 here, that zero, zero. You could have 10.20.00. And then of course you can have everything else. That's at layer three. At layer two, you could have your actual firewall. Still be at 10. 10.00 and 10.00 10 here, but the traffic analysis only happens at the firewall level as opposed to having routing and natting accordingly. Okay, so let's get deeper into what that really means and how you have ACLs, access control lists, as well as stable firewall rule controls as we move further into that concept. Now, the one thing to keep in mind about enterprise firewalls is that you have the concept of host-based firewalls and network-based firewalls. So network-based firewalls are all about north-south security, stuff coming in and out of the network and from your uh, corporate zones. So servers coming in and out of other networks and internet is what you're talking about, network north or south visibility. For east to west visibility, we really have the concept of host-based firewalls. So can I see anything from going close one to two? as opposed to relying on the firewall on the network. And host-based firewalls will allow you to do that because you have host-to-host, -host, east to west visibility accordingly. Now, when you have something in the DMZ, which is less trusted, you might have the need to have host-based firewalls in tandem with your network-based firewall. So you have that complete visibility that if an attacker got a hold of a DMZ asset here and they start attacking other DMZ assets, you won't know using a north to south only firewall because you'll only know if they're trying to get into the internal corporate network at that point. Maybe their admission is not to actually get into your internal corporate network, but maybe just cause chaos inside your DMZ based on where you're hosting assets today. Now your implementation architecture depends on a lot of different items. To our left here, we see multiple vendor types, Cisco ASA, uh, Palo Alto, Barracuda, Sophos, Checkpoint, Fortigate, and really all their about as being unified threat management. They don't just act as a normal layer three, layer four firewall. They may have application context awareness. And they, these are the physical appliances on what some of them look like from a rack mount server. However, some of these can also come into the form of virtualization appliances, as well as cloud-based firewalls as well. You wanna consider things like network throughput speed and security inspection requirements, hence deep packet inspection, sometimes called VPI. You also wanna look at your budget. Cisco ASAs, Palo Altos, they're kind of up there. But when you look at 
um, smaller vendor brands, they're made for smaller businesses. And so maybe you need that functionality and maybe you don't need true line speed, 10 gigabit per second performance, but you could do with one gigabit per second and the licensing might make more sense to you. More visibility generally means better performance in terms of a security architecture requirement. You also wanna look at which ones support high availability. Can you have two for every one? Can you mix and match with other firewalls on high availability? The hint is usually not. You also have network architecture items. Which one can operate at layer two? Well, not these, but what operate at layer two in terms of transparent firewalling. Well, Palo Alto does that. And Cisco ASA does that, uh, not out of the box, but you have to use their source fire layer edition, uh, later edition models. Ultimately, it's about what the combination is, what you need in terms of your network architecture and your use case requirements. So for instance, you also might have software defined networking. Well, you might create and reduce resources or change configurations based on what's called an SDN controller. Which one of these has that configuration capability? You don't know yet until you actually get into a um, solution architecture and implementation strategy when you do your planning and budgeting. Now, one thing to know about sizing and speed across almost all of this is throughput. Right, throughput is how much actual data you can measure going through X pipe in a test. So for instance, if you have a firewall that claims they can do a full uh, X amount of throughput that says based on a certain test, using this medium, such as CAT6 cabling, we were able to get an actual total of uh, one gigabit per second line speed. The bandwidth, however, is a little bit different. Bandwidth basically said, if you have a specific cable, such as CAT5E, CAT6, CAT7, and those are copper, the theoretical bandwidth is that you can actually have one gigabit per second um, across up to 100 meters. However, this is different for fiber, which could be 10 gigabits per second over 100 meters. It depends on what your actual bandwidth is, and that's the theoretical limit of the actual medium. Throughput is the actual in real life testing of how much data that can be processed at the uh, way the architecture and what the vendor is capable of for their software sitting on the actual appliance as opposed to just only the theoretical output of the cable itself. When you select them, make sure you understand what throughput means to them and how they measure performance. Here, for instance, we see that there's a UTM mode, which is Unified Threat Management, that has full scans of packets, full scans meaning TCP, all the payload, uh, and inspection at the stateful firewall level and better. However, at the firewall level, they actually define something interestingly different here. And this one is this watch guard. They say using UDP port, uh, with 1518 in terms of bytes, you can choose to get 19.6 gigabits per second as opposed to a mirror 2.1, which has stateful readiness. Look at the huge drop difference. Now that you would think UTM means Unified Threat Management, which includes antivirus, uh, intrusion prevention system modules or signatures, not in all vendors. Cisco and Palo Alto include that information accordingly, but WatchGuard is a little bit more tricky. They actually say antivirus and IPS are actually different. Full scan versus fast scans, which could mean incomplete scans, you actually drop down in performance quite a bit and you can get up to 3.5 gigabits per second using antivirus enabled um, and up to three gigabits per second for using full IPS scanning enabled. So you have to keep that in mind when you're utilizing one or more different solutions together in terms of what kind of feature sets you're looking for and what your network actually needs. Now what your network actually needs, you need to determine it based on how much data that you're actually pushing through that pipe. Do you need truly one gigabit per second? And here on this table that I have here, it's based on data set sizes. If you have petabytes of data, you might need a lot more. So to transfer uh, with a, a, a 10, ter 10 petabyte item in one minute, you need to have 10 terabyte, actually 166 terabytes worth of throughput a second. If you want to transfer that in an hour, well, you might have to have 2.78 terabytes per second. Now, think about this. Your home connection, most people are in the megabits and gigabits per second. Right, so that's really interesting kind of news here. So what you're really looking at is what is the right mixture? What is the right combination of how large your data set is to how much time you can bear or how much throughput speed you need? If you have a line that operates at 100 gigabits per second, 
then you need a certain amount of throughput capable of that. So your firewalls must have 100 gigabits per second throughput to actually accommodate for your data set and transfer of requirements. Don't be fooled by bandwidth. You need to measure based on throughput. And how do you measure how much pipe you need for your throughput? It's always based on the size of your data and your tolerable time to transfer that size of data. Keep that in mind as you're going forward as you architect your network. Now you also have security zones. Now we talked about firewalls and enterprise firewalls specifically having security zones. Here is a actual diagram of a very, very basic security zone segmentation. You wanna do it based on logical switching of things like servers, workstations, anything that has different security trust or context. Here we see that we have multiple routers and switches and logically connected to a firewall. That firewall has, in this case, three different legs. We have a demilitarized zone, but we have all our public facing information that in case they get compromised, we don't have automatic clearance to compromise the rest of the network. Now, why do we have security zones? We have security zones because what if you only have one security zone and these were actually in here? If you come from the internet, you can actually compromise laterally east to west everything instead of just compromising just this part and having to work your way here based on the security policy. The whole idea of security zones is that you want to have different layers of trust and different layers of security. So we have a three-leg firewall here, multi-home. We have a local area network that has workstations and servers attached to it. You can even have four zones, right? You can have your DMZ. Actually, let's clear out that screen just a little bit more. A little messy for me. And then we can have actually four zones if we really want to. We have our outside here, our completely untrusted. We have our DMZ here. We have our servers, which are uh, high trust, high requirements. So server zone here. And we have our local stations, which are desktops. So multi-home firewalls, multiple contacts, which might mean you might have more security out here for less trusted requirements. Lots of security here, maybe a medium level of grade security here because, well, let's face it, users get infected all the time, but you want to make sure that you have policies restricting direct access to servers whenever they want. The more security zones you have, all the more administrative overhead you have, the less likely you're going to have multiple parts of your network compromised in one go. Networks that only don't have any security zones, just the concept of inside and outside, such as your home network in most cases, outside, inside, right? That is a flat network. So if you only have an inside where you have wireless AP in your house and you don't have multiple security zones, hence multiple layer three networks in that case, you might be compromised completely. If someone got to one workstation, they're able to hop into other um, east to west based boundaries and the firewall can't do anything about that for you because you don't have multiple home zones. Most firewalls today have stateful inspection. Stateful packet inspection basically means, did you create an actual established three-way handshake? And we have state tables for that. The state tables are actually based inside tuples. So tuples based on source, port, source address, destination address, and destination port, and whether the TCP connection is established. Now, think back to what it means for TCP connections. Okay, hopefully you thought about it. TCP requires the handshake, right? You have your send, you have your send app, and then you finally have your app to create an established connection. When that connection is no longer established, either through your bin, ACK, or TCP resets, then that connection is no longer going to be part of a valid state table. Now, your state table is a separate piece of memory inside your firewall. And so before it even decides on any kind of traffic going allow or block, you have to have a valid TCP connection state anyways. Now, for protocols such as UDP, ICMP that don't have any connection state, it'll still inspect it based on what is allowed in and out of the system. The TCP though, because of the capabilities of spoofing, you have a little bit more security, another layer on top. But we'll see that this is a possibility of a denial of service um, if you don't have the right mitigations and protections in place for stateful firewall inspection. Deep packet inspection is all at layers five and seven. So we talked about Palo Alto, Sourcefire, uh, AKA Cisco ASAs, um, stuff of, of that nature that understand the application level. You may have different feature sets such as intrusion detection and prevention, 
antivirus uh, exploding using a sandbox of malware samples of captures over binaries, behavioral analysis, and even SSL inspection, which means uh, also known as termination. Termination at the protocol level means you can actually inspect it by decrypting it, terminating at one side, and then reestablishing it on the back end. A single firewall physically or virtually logically acts as a unified threat management device, or also called next generation firewall, whatever buzzword term you decide to use. Throughput performance does suffer because it's not as fast at lower la layers, but you also get more visibility and more value out of a single appliance versus multiple appliances. The other one that you want to consider is the budget. Do you need to have professional services come help you install it? Are you new to firewalls? Well, you might have a statement of work with that. Do you already have different complementary security mechanisms? And what is your total cost of ownership as you need to look at your budget of your firewall? You might have cheap firewalls coming up front. But then what about the license renewals for each one year, three year periods? And what does finance want you to do? Are you allowed to allow to use three year renewals as opposed to one year renewals based on their tax reporting requirements? Consult with your financial team as well as your other logistics and partnership teams regarding your vendors and what you might need based on your expertise on what you select. Another concept is that we have high availability. So when you have an enterprise firewall, you typically don't have one. What happens when your internet goes out at your house? Well, it might be inconvenienced for a day until a new one arrives or if you go to the store and grab one. What about a business? What about the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange? What happens when their firewalls go down for major internet or transaction purposes? Money's lost every millisecond. So the whole idea is that have high availability whenever possible, and we do those based on pair, pairs and or clusters. We have multiple concepts, including active-active, which traffic flows uh, inbound to both series, or you have active-passive, where only one switches over during a uh, failover. So if the hardware fails over on both sides here, this will start becoming uh, this will become your new actual firewall on firewall cluster B. Now, there's also the concepts of pair versus clusters. So a pair is obviously two. This can be one segment here and one segment there. But if you don't have cluster capability with multiple pairs, what if one goes down? Or what if you need to scale up? Well, you need to have 10 gigabits per second versus one gigabit per second. Will you be able to add more firewalls to the cluster? Because you can't just replace firewalls at willy-nilly when you, when you want. Most of the time, pairs inside clusters for high availability require of the same size and modeling in most cases. If you're able to cluster firewalls at different sizes, using the same operating system, you might have more flexibility and scalability accordingly. Remember that pairs are just pairs. They can operate active passive on physical device links and clusters are made of multiple pairs whenever possible that allow you to scale up and horizontally in terms of new speeds, capabilities, and general compute power whenever possible. Firewalls also fail closed. So if you also have a firewall that just, you have one firewall total, they fail closed. So if you have your, only one of them together, you have no more network traffic in those cases. Now, you saw clustered pairs. Now here's unclustered. Here's what it looks like. You have two different links, but you only have two actual devices, virtually or physically. If one goes down, the other one has a backup. However, you can't scale anything past that. So you would have to actually scale up Let's say we place both of these from going one gigabit per second to 10 gigabits per second. So you have to place both at the same time, creating a larger outage window. Now here's something more interesting to even think about as well in your terms of your total architecture. Let's say I have active active. Which means traffic is distributed on both sides at the same time. What if I have 100% going on here and it needs to fail over and this one's already operating at 50%? You'll have 150% worth of traffic coming in and both of them might fail or this one might operate in a completely degraded state or the, the uh, traffic for the failover might be dropped and it'll have to re be reestablished. So you don't have an actual stateful failover, which means your connections will also be dropped and the applications would have to resend that traffic. Think back again to about things like NASDAQ and stock trading. If you had a failover without stateful failover, aka seamless failover, what do you think is gonna happen if you had to make a trade at that very millisecond? 
well, your application would have to reestablish that connection. And that section of timeout might be 30 seconds, five minutes, or one minute. Every second you've lost there for that transaction that didn't go through is money loss. Keep that in mind as you're creating clusters versus pairing in terms of the high availability of your firewall architecture. Now, on much larger network architectures, you might have different things. You might have network switching cores. You might have multiple, par multiple partners. You might also have Internet of Things and many other things that go. You have to keep in mind with the network engineering team what their plans are. So plan ahead and plan early and understand strategically what they're moving to. Some of them are moving to different types of architectures, such as spine and leaf, away from the three-tier modeling design, or some of them might be going to all cloud. Your firewall must be logically capable of implementing at their network architecture level accordingly. How do you fit into the piece? So think about speeds, architecture types, and future plans, and always consult with your network engineering team at the very start of your beginning of your project. Now, what are common network architecture types? Well, you have typical three-tiered architecture. There's always trouble in threes. So when you think about it, you have access layer, distribution layer, and core. Core has your fast layer of switching, which routes between networks at layer three and layer two, potentially. Logically, you might have distribution layers, which are about uh, usually closer to your access issues, such as servers that are uh, at a parent region. And of course, you have your access layers, which are things like different data centers amongst each other, as well as different workstations on a specific VLAN. Just know that the aggregation doesn't happen, uh, but at the core, which has your fastest switching capability and routing capability. But remember, there's upstream links at each one, and those are only so fast. And while there may be redundant upstream links, you are still limited based on how fast upstream links are, which could be 10 gigabits per second, or one gigabit per second, or anything faster. The point is you have to go up and back, up and down in the hierarchy chain to get to certain errors. You don't have east to west direct connections from uh, this access WAN to this internet WAN right here. You can't go across. You have to go up to the distribution layer, eventually to the core and back down again, which creates an inefficient capability. But for a long time, that was as efficient as it gets based on the original technology that you have. It's heavily focused on proximity efficiency and hierarchy base. Now, spine and leaf is a completely different architecture type, and that's a more modern one, which is what we call software defined network ready. Here, you have a huge trunk, if you will, a leaf, and all leaves are connected to the same spine, which you have all core structure. Look at how many links that you have. So, you have multiple redundant links at every single leaf side, so everyone has east to west visibility and switching. Now, when you think about firewall visibility, how will you actually see stuff like that? Well, you have firewall contextually aware and implementation capable spinal leaf architecture, usually at layer two, and you might have to have a combination of host and network-based network -based IDSs right here, or uh, network-based firewalls right here at this level, while you might have host-based levels at the leaf only, leaf to leaf level. So keep that in mind as you go through spinal leaf, you're removing a tier and you're adding a wide variety of cross functional traffic, east to west traffic. Here it is again, in case you need to have another um, breadth of understanding and, and simple context. We have a multi tier architecture that's hierarchy based. Aggregation tends to happen at the distribution layer, and you have multiple links. However, with two tier spinal link format, everything happens where everyone has a huge uh, connection to the backbone, and you have a lots of east to west uh, traffic. So I have going up through the core as a rainbow here. I can honestly just go through here a little bit easier in most cases. So I'm not skipping an actual abstraction here instead of going to the spine where my core switching and fast speeds need to be a part of. Now, software defined networking is exactly what it sounds like. You define the network based on software needs. And you have a traditional items. So instead of you having what we did in different modules, which was actually program each different device and make sure that each of these configurations were compatible, you have programmable switches and routers, virtualized or based on hardware requirements, and you have a controller. You utilize infrastructure as code or software as code or architecture as code, whichever you want to call it. Cloud uh, architecture works the same way. 
you have a concept of a controller and code that says, I need my switch or my, my routing and my network to operate in a very specific basis, a very specific basis, and it programs this based on devices and what makes sense. So another layer of abstraction and not having to require you going into router A, router B, router C, and I hope that you make the correct configurations at each point. This is called software defined networking, and it's a really interesting concept because the cloud already implements this on a regular basis. Now, when I say infrastructure as code, I mean cloud natively does this for you. One popular one is Terraform. Terraform basically introduces the idea that if you define exactly what you want in somewhat like a script like you see here, you can actually have it automatically spin up different network capability comp components and such as AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud uh, platform, and you can define exactly how your network should look and operate and perform utilizing only code. So amazing, only, it's really hard to do so inside a private cloud on premise, but using public cloud providers and services, they already have mastered this for you and can reduce your total cost. You're more than likely gonna utilize infrastructure as code in a hybrid type of environment. So keep on the lookout you can actually define your own network and spin it all up in minutes and seconds as opposed to months and days. Now, a hybrid firewall strategy consists of network firewalls as well as host-based firewalls. Having a firewall that's host-based as well as software-defined network and virtual aware allows more for east to west visibility, but also allows for architecture and reconfiguration standards at mass when you have an SDN-aware firewall. In this case, what we have here is a hypervisor firewall that is aware, uh, aware of Microsoft-based virtualization. Instead of having a firewall installed on each and every host, you can have a firewall operating on each switch or each hypervisor that understands information that each host is connected to. This thereby gives additional information and context, as well as the information and performance of not having waste performance on at individual instance layers, but at the hypervisor layer itself. You can utilize a controller from an SDN controller like up here to define how the firewalls need to have security policies allowing and blocking different traffic. All right, that was a lot of information. If you didn't get all of it, take a break, go back and review the information. And let's come back to um, everything and continue further in our networking portion of this module. Okay. Welcome back from your break. Let's go ahead and continue forward with about firewall configurations and how to impl implement them accordingly. So firewall configurations consist of many different contexts. We'll go over those on how to not only implement your firewalls from a hardware and logical perspective, but what kind of policies that we have and why do we need to use different policies for different segments. First and foremost, policies. There's always one policy for every um, layer at layer three. So one policy per every network segment leg. This policy is from a checkpoint enterprise firewall that says you have allows and denies according to our tuples here, right? Source and destination, uh, a group, a service and action, which is drop or deny, log it, and deploy it across different firewall types. We have security zones, such as the DMZ internal corporate network, or the outside untrusted interfaces that you apply different policies to. The policy consists of multiple sets of rules and they always operate on a top-down hierarchy of order processing. Here are the rules as, I, uh, as I've circled already. The evaluation logic is based on that performance, so higher amounts of rule access and usage should be at the top. And deny should also be at the very top as well. So again, how rules operate. You have allows and denies based on tuples, which are source and destination IPs, ports and protocols at the minimum. You should have higher evaluations or higher hit counts at the very top along with your denies for performance reasons. Notice here in these diagrams that you want the highest ones at the top with 23K of hits on average per second, make a lot more sense than 11K being processed at the top. Once you process the rule and it matches a rule, it stops processing uh, for that specific piece of traffic for that for any other rules subsequently. You want this for performance reasons as well as safety reasons because you wouldn't want to deny traffic only after you've allowed it. Deny rules are always at the top, high traffic rules are always at the top, and there's implicit cleanup. So although you don't see it right here, anything else is any, any, any deny, right? 
So you want to practice the least privileged requirements by reducing your rule set types and ordering the rules based on the best performance possible based on that ordered evaluation and performance. Remember, the more rules you have, the more is loaded into memory. So let's think about how we actually have northbound and southbound traffic security and policy context. How would we do policy management across east to west? Other than network firewalls, you have to have it on each host based policy. So this host will have its own policy, this host will have its own policy, and that becomes very cumbersome. If you have an enterprise management solution or an SDN where firewall software, such as Symantec or something of that nature, or McAfee EPO, you could have a uh, single policy distributed across multiple as assets based on tags or aware items. Or you have the SDN controller, for instance, and it says, based on my code, infrastructure as code, when you configure all of these and these switches here accordingly and control all of this via single code or a policy context standpoint. Now we're gonna get into a concept. We talked about NAT in previous modules, but we didn't talk about what NAT really does other than it being a translation. Yes, there's a translation of source and destination IPs, but what direction and what else is beneficial to that? So that translates different IP addresses from public to private. PAT, on the other hand, is its cousin, which is port address translation, which basically means I have NAT plus ports. So instead of just translating a pair of IPs, it will do also source port and destination port just like you would do um, with a actual firewall rule. So let's get down into why we have PAT and NAT together when we can only, uh, we already have what's called a reference as NAT. You actually have a PAT at your house because you're actually utilizing ports. And we'll see that in the upcoming uh, slide. First, let's understand the difference between NAT and PAT directions. A destination NAT goes towards the host. Okay, towards the host from the outside, untrusted to trusted. Source net egresses from your host to the untrusted side. That's all it really means. Don't let it get too confusing. Remember that destination comes to you, source comes from you to somewhere else. An example of a source PAT, which is also NAT technology, is the fact that we have source, which is a multiple internal IPs mapped to one external IP. And then there's a translation that happens at a table, just like with stateful firewall rules with source port, destination port, and then provides a kind of a termination of a connection outbound to the initial destination. So if you have multiple source IP addresses contacting a web server at the same time over the same port, each of those based on source NAT or source PAT will have a likely different source IP address and source port number associated with that combination. The only time you have an actual conflict is if you have the same connection to the outbound with the same exact IP address and the same exact port number at any one point. This is almost never gonna happen because you, have, you can't have multiple same IP addresses on the same network segment. We call these source paths many to one because you're having many connections to one IP address going egress. So this is what you have commonly at your house one IP address, many to one, going outbound to google.com. Here it is again with source uh, port address translation. Just like a stateful firewall rule table, you have source IP, port, destination IP, and destination port, and then the translation happens at your router or your firewall. And so the new source IP uh, comes from your public facing IP, in my case, maybe 8888, it creates a new mapping of a 500 uh, of a new connection, which is 5200, and the final destination IP and source, which these two never change. Destination path is the complete opposite. Think of reverse proxies or load balancers. And so you have destination coming to you. Let's say I have a server form that hosts multiple web services from. Destination path allows me to connect to the same host or multiple hosts across different port and IP combination pairings based on the service requirement. Destination paths are really utilized and useful for load balancing purposes, as well as anything that you host from an on-premise perspective. Now here's some performance tuning tips for any firewall and firewall rule base. 
stateful files, make sure you have a large enough state table for any, and you have the extra memory so you can process more connections at any one point. Um, and you also make sure that if you have a firewall that operates at layer two, can you free up it from having to do NAT and routing when you don't need to? Let the network engineering team use routing devices for that versus security. You want to trim policies on unnecessary rules that you need and disable what you don't need in case you're doing testing so that the, that the rules don't get loaded into memory. You also want to offload unnecessary functions, hence our bullet point up here. Makes it saying a firewall should be a firewall. Should it really NAT or PAT anything once you really need it to? And of course, your firewalls, as you get to future network engineering engagements and architecture, are the virtualization and SDN aware. Can they reconfigure themselves based on infrastructure as code concepts as we saw earlier? Now, as part of firewall decision-making processes, one of the main things that kind of stick out and what, what most firewalls are based out of, at least from an architecture standpoint, for many, many years is IP tables. The whole idea is that IP tables contains tables, contains chains. Chains contains rules, and the firewall portion of that uh, that we will look at is called the filtration table. The filtration table. You can have the idea of natting, pre-routing information here, and you filter table having multiple chains. Each of these filter tables has changed that allow different decision-making processes, whether to port traffic based on two different interfaces out on that, or take it as a host-based inbound or host-based outbound process based on multiple policies. Hence, that's layer three, which we have different policies on AKA different chains across the same uh, requirement. And how flexible that is required depends on what your use cases are. So IP tables can be very powerful for that. And it evaluates just like any other firewall only you can utilize it on any Linux operating system. So then we have the concept of filter table. We have three main chains for them. The chains are input, output, port. Input basically says, come into my host. So if I hosted a server, and I'm listening to a particular process, so this is an open port SSH. If you wanted to block stuff coming inbound to my local process, you would utilize the input chain. If you didn't, if you wanted to make decisions based on not coming to you, but going to a, a network. So let's say you are connected to a 10.10.00 slash 24 leg, and you're also connected to 192.168.0 slash 24. You can make decisions based on block 192.168.0 on all TCP 25 being forwarded to the um, 10 network to the one on two with C8 network. You also have the output chain, which basically says anything from a local progress going egress. So if I was making a IP tables firewall on my Ubuntu virtual machine, and I wanted to utilize a ping command and I can block ICMP going outbound on that chain accordingly. I create rules for each of these chains that attaches accordingly and rules you evaluated what? Top, to, um, top down. Here's an example of creating IP tables rules saying, allow at the input, allow host space to me, only to me, not to any between networks. Coming inbound, allow 80 and 443 and accept that. The J is for jump. That's what it means, but that's why it's J versus like a dash action. Then now you have allow anywhere coming inbound to any of these rules based on the input policy chain. Input mean that it comes directly to this host, which is Linux hint, but not being forwarded to a different network using the forward chain. All right, it's time for a break and a demo. Go ahead and take a, a breather and we'll come back and look at different firewall configurations and setting up firewall rules for your local host. Hi, and welcome back from your break. I hope it was a good one. I wanted to show you an example of the Unified Threat Management Firewall made for a small business and small enterprises. This is my own personal one at my own home. And so what we have here is a single device appliance that has the ability of high availability if I did a pair. It includes lots of different information accordingly based on the health of the device, as well as the information accordingly here. 
most enterprise firewalls without any kind of unified threat management uh, solutions or modules will have no understanding of what clients are connected and the different traffic. UTMs have the ability to profile traffic and create uh, quality of service or intrusion prevention or other rule sets based on the application layer seven layers. You should see here that we have, we're a pretty big Netflix household. I can also look at topology information and understand where my different items are accordingly for this. More importantly, it includes threat management, which also includes the ability to block um, and allow traffic according to potential malicious traffic uh, inbound and outbound. As that's loading, we can actually go back and see where traffic is going and look at the logs. And it looks like we're having trouble with that particular version. Let's see if I can actually switch it back to um, endpoint scans. Nope, looks like it's a, a bug in this release. That's okay. If I go to alerts here though, then it can give me information about uh, who's connected and who, who wasn't connected. And also information about potential intrusion prevention system information and other whatnots. I can also go to my own settings and set for security purposes, which rules I have enabled and the sensitivity whenever possible. I can also scan and do different things. And remember, this is all thanks to the idea of the fact that we have higher level firewalls to do this. Now these are uh, made simple for most uh, small medium business management purposes, but not all firewalls will have the same interesting looking interface. Just know that the unified threat management typically has a lot more details and information about how you can create policies against where, where you have this. So let's go into another aspect of your Ubuntu virtual machine. I've installed, you, uh, you already have UFW, but you might install the app search UFW GUI version, which is GUFW. If you install that, you might have all this installed as part of the requirement. Now I'm inside as a root right now using sudo bash because it's just easier. And I now I'll have the UFW firewall. And this has a huge amount of chains and information policies and rules that are applied, allowing anywhere for UDP and TCP and other information that I may not want. UFW status, give me that as active. If I go UFW disable, then I can go IP tables.l again. And notice that all these rules are now gone set for these unless I flush the table. Still have internet connectivity. The UFW stat, uh, UFW new, which is an uncomplicated firewall. And of course I can use my GUI to go ahead and allow this too. I can go to my rules. I can have a profile status if I want. You can also add rule names. So I can allow and deny inbound category or subcategory, or I can use simple rules or advanced rules based on what I'm looking for. Let's use my rule name of test. I want to block direction inbound, UDP coming in for 53, right? Add that rule, and I add it for IPv4 and IPv6. Let's go into IP tables. And now I should see rule for uh, 53. So uh, I'll grep it out. I don't have anything for DNS. How about DNS? There we go. So it resolves this for me and allows stuff anywhere, including multicast, coming in inbound to um, multicast DNS here. I'm going to try UDP. And here we go. We have a sub anywhere, sub domain state, and we have drop right here. Drop anything UDP domain from anywhere, anywhere. Now this is interesting because 
If you go back to your IP tables information here, you have all this information that you have to expand upon and understand where, where each one goes to. Well, let's say I don't have a GUI anymore. Well, we can certainly do something like this. So let's go ahead and delete these. And then we'll quickly look up UFW examples. We'll use this. And now we can utilize the same kind of concept premise, which is, well, if I want to block everything from this original source, I'll just type in UFW deny from like this. We'll add it, status, and I have rule. I can also do UFW remove a rule. And to do that, we'll look this up accordingly. UFW man page, manual page. And now we can also do removing a rule. We need to use delete the rule based on the number. Okay, that sounds pretty good. UFW delete the first rule. Yes. And now I go UFW status. All rules are now removed from there. So what does that look like in terms of actual items for what we need to use? Well, we can use UFW, which is a wrapper, add that rule one last time and, and look at IP tables. Now we need to look up, here we go. We have a drop in our inbound from anywhere. Go ahead and uh, remove that rule. Now, that was a really simple syntax. And of course, you can look up more information about the UFW syntax accordingly, which makes things a little bit easier. And there's also a wrapper around IP tables. If you want the raw IP tables format, simply look it up here. Actually, you've got IP tables rules. And here we go. You would want to specify the IP tables command, adding a rule to a very a pin, aka a pin to a chain, right? And you can actually establish different requirements, such as inbound to an ethernet from the source, drop all traffic coming from that source based on that action, which is the jump command. You can find more information about this in the actual lecture material and play around with this if you wish. That does get a little cumbersome. And so while we might have GUIs for that, let's create an actual enterprise version of that. Beforehand, I installed F, uh, FW Builder, which is a firewall uh, GUI configuration creator and generator. I'll close this. I want to create a new firewall. I want to say start the name of it, which is test. And instead of having complex using IP tables or UFW in here, I can actually create this, which is portable for a particular kernel version if I even wish. Let's use a pre-configured firewall template. And we'll say, well, what kind of zoning information do I want? A house, I just want an inside and outside simple zone. A DMZ segment, which is a pretty common one. And it tells you exactly what it has here and what kind of natting is associated with it. I'll click on next. I can establish how I want my configured firewall to be, just as I were making Ubuntu VM um, an actual appliance of a firewall. I'll leave these default for now, but notice how the different layer three segments occur based on DMZ inside and outside. I can also have IPv6, if so desired, and dynamic DHCP or static IP address default. Finish. And now, I have a sample set of firewall rules that has NAT information here, how to translate inside and outside accordingly, already set up for me. Now I can set my policy as well. I can set my information about the objects in here, or I can have it in my single policy and I specify my source and destination, as well as my interfaces, which means, remember, each one of these has a different requirement. 
outside, inside, and then DMZ for uh, Ethernet 2. And I can also change these and edit and add whenever possible what this might look like. To add a new rule, we can add it at the very top. And here is my default deny, deny any, any cleanup. I might add it accordingly and set my actual rule for what I want it to do. I can insert a new rule or remove the rule. And I, saw, I can also compile the rule and add different colors for it. I want to remove the rule. And let's see if we can add a new one we want to compile. And then on my desktop, I'll build our test. Inspect the generated files. Now, using a bash shell script, you can actually deploy it to an actual um, Linux operating system, which will create IP tables commands. See those references here? And add the forward and drop information all for you. And really, this is also considered infrastructure as code when you look at it, only you're doing this on premise. It's pretty neat. Look at the different information of routing rules for natting. Here, the syntax is made for you based on GUI. And we generate this infrastructure as code instead of doing this by hand, which is great for automation purposes. Now, we're not going to install and deploy it to a particular firewall, but I wanted to give that to you uh, for some more information. Let's go ahead and add a new rule. And I can actually change I can actually change this accordingly too. So I can actually drag and drop objects like address ranges into this and change the direction such as accounting, queuing, um, and the direction state. So it's the interface that makes the most sense. So that's how you utilize infrastructure as code from a GUI on-premise perspective. And you can create different firewall rules for actually different types of um, uh, commands and items. So if you wanted to actually create one for a Cisco ASA, you'd create a new firewall accordingly. So we'll close this one. We'll create a new, um, a new firewall. And I'd rather just start from the beginning so I get the nice little wizard. I use the and so it turns back to me. Create a new firewall, test, and instead of IP tables, we can use Cisco ASA. I can add firewall objects accordingly as well, based on these templates, which are really nice. And that's it. You can change and play with those. You'll find those out in your lab. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time in the next module.